Welcome. This is the September 11th OpenZFS production user call. We have Andrew, Dan, Jan, Greg, Stu, and myself, Michael, so far. And I have a bunch of event planning news. Uh, and on one quick point, Dan kindly pointed out OSLV Monitor, which is an, a plugin for LibreNMS, which allows for very detailed top-like output. So there's a link in the notes. Thank you for sharing that earlier, Dan. And regarding the upcoming user and developer summit, I had a very productive meeting with Matt Ahrens Monday morning, and I gave him a rundown on all topics. And here's, I'll give you a summary now, and some of that is uh, involving some of you looking around the room while Stu is waiting on a delivery. We have four sponsors. That is good, but not perfectly optimal. The call for participation for the developer summit where it'll follow the traditional model of having a day of talks uh, closes Friday. So please reach out to Matt Ahrens with any reports you wanna give and updates and such because it's been really good to have like, okay, what's AWS doing with CFS, et cetera. Um, the big push that Patrick and I have been doing for audio video gear for EuroBSDCon and BSDCAN will benefit this event. So I have a bunch of new toys here that will go to Europe next week, but will return for OpenZFS saving several thousand dollars. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's some little hardware upgrades that need to happen, but that's pretty simple, like tables, exciting power strips, not too expensive, should be within the budget. I made huge progress on the networking of the venue. So that has a plan. Jan, I might have some questions about programming a certain brand of Latvian routers, not to be named. Um, I made note of the request for say stickers and mugs. And we realized that employers might, want not, might not want to pay for luxuries like that. So we won't have them on the like sign up form. We'll just have a table with them for sale. Contracts are out, speaker discount codes are out. Kind of, Sponsor discount codes are out, little housekeeping things that just hadn't happened. And uh, let's talk food. And I'm looking at you, Stu, and Santi, if he makes it. So uh, I would love to have a foodie. I would love to have someone's like aunt or grandma or brother or someone who just loves to cook. And we spoil them with quality ingredients and spend preferably like thousands upon thousands on food ingredients rather than the classic conference center $10,000 coffee break because that's really high markup coffee and not necessarily very good coffee. So uh, Stu, you had mentioned some uh, amount of interest in say doing maybe was it a sausage barbecue or some form of thing? Yeah, because Santi was going to do... Whatever, Argentinian trailer. barbecue. Yes. yes. And I was going to do uh, my smoked pork chili. Okay. Uh, do you have any vegan friendly variations on that? Uh, unfortunately, I have nothing that is vegan <laughs> okay. or kosher for that matter. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, does that mean you're willing to? commit to one of the say evening meals perhaps yeah i mean with yeah whatever because i mean it's one of those if we do a you know an outdoor you know the, the grilling outside and you know the chili and the and santi's stuff would all be complimentary mm -hmm. um at least flavor wise um try and think what else I would, I'll, I'll go full, back full circle to wanting a foodie such that someone is willing to, or we either break up the responsibilities and say, hey, this simpler lunch is the responsibility of this person, or we have one person who just loves to cook and is unstoppable, and we compensate them with surplus from the event, so hoping there's surplus from the event. Um, um, so everyone who might be attending, uh, think about in. your relatives, etc. Yes, Jan, you're going to talk about food safety have, or something? Um, yeah. yeah, because at uh, Chaos Computer Club events, we have a um, volunteer kitchen, mm -hmm. and that worked well for lots of years, but uh, after a certain size, well, we uh, finally lost the lottery, 
And uh, since then, we have a dedicated, uh, basically, a food safety team. Mm -hmm. uh, because the worst that can happen to an event is if you have some stomach bug going around in the volunteer kitchen. Mm -hmm. So um, you, one person isn't enough to do everything. You really need someone to, just, even if you have just one cook, to prepare for them, clean off dishes, or you have to at least have someone do that, and, uh, or have the venue do it. Uh, but if the venue does it, they probably want to handle the rest as well at a ridiculous markup. Yep. So, so as... get a few people with acceptable hygiene, uh, a basic understanding that things like hairnets are nice for the others. Um, so that otherwise one person will not be able to handle any reasonable sized event. Indeed, and for what it's worth, Multnomah County food handlers permits are not difficult to get. There's at least one in the family here. I've considered getting that and or the uh, bartender certification, which apparently you have, Stu. Do you have I any have such certs? Do you have the a food handlers permit? No, I only have the bartender for okay. Washington, Oregon. Cool. Uh, so maybe separately we can have a a powwow on that because I uh, one I'd love to have a team I'd love to have a team lead and then just map it out and check all the check boxes we can. As far as um, eating require our food requirements goes, I know there was a thing on the uh, uh, sheet we filled out about that. Has yeah. any, do we have any listed? That's Has anybody a said question? Uh, I mean, if because if nobody said they have restrictions, then a lot of this is kind yeah. of moot. Right, we're, oh. we're fighting. We're fighting a battle. We don't need to fight. Absolutely. True, uh, Andrew. Did you, in a previous call, mention that you have some form of restrictions or preferences? No, not really. Okay. Um, so I don't think the basic food safety changes one bit, regardless of the <laughs> the culture oh, you pursue. Absolutely, <laughs> but I'm. Like, I, I, I'm talking about yeah, things like yeah. kosher or vegan. Yeah, sure. Because uh, and... I mean, I, I'm absolutely behind if people have those kind of restrictions. Yeah, we got to meet those, but sure. if we don't, we don't. Well, and it's it's also part of it too. Is if it's a part of the event or if it's a sidecar event. Mm. Of, hey, we're going out for drinks or we're going out for you know pizza or whatever. You know, that's a not officially an open ZFS conference event. It just happens to be a bunch of people oh, getting correct. together. Correct. Uh, which is are... kind of why the barbecue thing was where we were leaning because it's that type of cover mm -hmm. or umbrella. Um. Our venue is conducive to various forms of indoor and outdoor cooking. And this event traditionally is very, very first name basis intimate, which is great. Something unique about it, such that um, we're, we're in a way not prod predominantly catering to the public, such as when you have a riverside beer garden fest. Right. So I want to find that healthy, safe middle ground on all this. So I welcome your ideas and again i don't want to like get into food details on this call but let's just start thinking about who can help map that out we still have some time but i do want to have a plan or know if i have to kick into just third party caterers we can do it we do have a a renter who has catered events um so Maybe I'll reach out to them too, but I'd love to keep it close to the community. And so far as uh, that, the yeah, Argentinian barbecue sure sounds good. I mean, short short of I'm very good friends with the owner of Stark Street Pizza. Um, that's pretty much my only in in the food world in Portland. Okay, I do have an in with very nearby, also flying pie pizza, and I think several of us are scarred from the pizza last year. It was sort of probably very expensive yet nothing to write home about and i think we ran out so i'm like uh let's look at food differently 
So anyway. Well, Sorry. all fair, all fair things, but you know, it's a four day event this time, not just two. So correct. And hence full circle. If we had a foodie, that would be awesome. And I'll, I'll be shopping for foodies. I'll even talk to this aforementioned renter. So, but having like so far two of you to commit to something is a huge encouraging step. Moving on. Uh, so before recording, Jan, you had mentioned uh, the shortcomings of, say, both LibZFS and channel programs. Well, I took a moment to formalize topics to hand off to developers, and Matt Perrins and I covered some of those in depth. I'll scroll up, and I organized this list some, which was overdue. So I identified three topics, and I welcome us all to flesh them out today. This list has sure grown, my gosh, but at the very top in bright red are three developer topics. And so number one, can we have a committed lib open CFS interface? The conversation last week was very, very constructive about what do we have? What do we need? What do we think it would look like? What are the kind of metrics for success? Um, please quickly read through this and see if, have, see if you have anything to add. Even just the motivations are very important because a developer with a motivation and a budget will maybe find the best and shortest path to something rather than us just spelling out in detail how what we think it should look like without necessarily having insights into the underlying plumbing and previous reasoning. So that's one. The other was the notion of a container-friendly uh, whiteout file system or UnionFS-like facility. Alan Jude made a prototype several years ago. Rob has possibly seen it. I didn't get an answer out of him yesterday if he's since seen it, but uh, I'll make a note here, container-friendliness. Contain T-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-I-N-A-
and uh, Linux has it too, but of course done in a different way. And if this happens, we have a nice additional use case where ZFS saves the day across multiple operating systems. So what might be some of those essential underlying mechanisms beyond snapshots? What might ZFS add that should not be handled by a higher level Isaac layer goodie? Um, the higher levels, no, unless they're deeply, deeply tied to ZFS, they don't know as much about, basically they don't know that these source non points are technically truly immutable and therefore will never change and cannot disappear and can be prevented from disappearing. Would we be because lying to the higher levels? Not as far as I think. Okay, we, what's we're not lying. They said that at the end there's a mount point which contains the union of the stack of snapshots with uh -huh. uh, persistent modifications as just one mount point. Okay. If that's possible, it would be really nice. Uh, and Rob said he thinks it should be doable, but I'm not the one who can make that call if it's. Just... So have a union of snapshots that's ultimately writable at the top level. Is that accurate? Uh, with a writable data set on top. Okay. Yeah. And the important part is that you get to destroy or, or replace uh, the snapshots. And then it would be OK if you have to unmount to do that, I think. So that, But the important part is that you can basically get with Rockflow. You cannot get with ZFS snapshots and clones, because you can do it with ZFS snapshots and clones, but if you ever write to a clone, any writes to the clone are trapped in the clone and you cannot rebase its origin. And that's the use case containers want, but you have things like your local configuration directory where you have your let's encrypt certificates, your configuration uh, uh, in one data set and in another one, you have your uh, database, and of course, um, maybe another, you have simple static files you're hosting for a web application or something, and you want to rebase the add to the next version of your image stack mm -hmm. um, uh, for an update, just maybe just a little bug fix, which doesn't even require a special um, migration step. Mm -hmm. But even uh, that you can't do with clones unless ahead of time you perfectly separated your uh, mount points so that you can have data sets which have the modifications and started out busy empty so that you split it up into the right subdirectory trees. That can be done uh, manually for most use cases. It's a bit Annoying that you have to do it, it requires a deep understanding of ZFS, and you have to do it ahead of time. Yep. And we all know that new users are great at anticipating future uh, usage of their data, it. right? Yep, yep, yep. So if you could just give users something which requires less... Uh, preparation and less care, but still works and solves that problem that basically is quickly instantiating containers without having to um, unpack the or flatten the stack. So what you can already do is, and that's what you do with OCI uh, container images, you uh, untar one tarball, then you apply mm -hmm. whiteouts, and yep. then you do repeat that process. Apply whiteouts, next tarball. Apply whiteouts, next tarballs, and so on. But that uh, means that you have now a file system which is the um, flattened view of that. And if any part of that stack changes, 
let's say your FreeBSD base uh, yep, yep, yep. image changes. So now basically all of your gels have to be completely regenerated. And that still only solves the problem of having the flattened immutable part. Mm -hmm. But it does not help you with uh, the persistent data you want to combine with that. Yeah, I'm tempted um, to say we're spoiled on ZFS. Are we not? All right off, right out of the gate. <laughs> yeah. Um, you could also say you you could, uh, but that would be a bit fragile. You could also do it with replicate incremental replication streams, so that your first image is instead of a tarball is a full replication stream, and then all of the non bottom layers of your stack are incremental. Replication streams, yep. but that yeah doesn't uh, make it better. In this case, it's just a more specialized implementation of the idea of layering tasks. And yeah. Okay, is there a name that just kind of mentally sticks, like union clones or clone unions, just, or clone groups, or uh, stacks, or something? Probably, just a uh, draft term. I Go assume ahead. it would be a new uh, new data a set new, type. Probably a new clone that, type. So it's a no, not, oh. it um. would be just like a yeah, either it would be a file system with a special property hmm. or similar to a clone, just that it has a something a new basically clones gain new features or a it would be a new type of uh, data set, a union of other data sets. So that the union is its own data set and then has properties for uh, to attach uh, children to it or something. Or uh, origins, basically, not children. And yeah, it would either be a file system contain its persistent part or it would not, and then it would reference an existing normal uh, file system. Okay. These are choices I can only speculate about because I'm not that deeply familiar with the code. No, yeah, exactly. But we, yeah, but every amount we paint this picture, the more someone can mm -hmm. have their gears so, turned in their heads. So, uh, so uh, it's, it's a bit use case still in there. The motivation uh, part. Uh, I put one with a preface. Did you uh, override the... Rebase uh, changes uh, to containers? Yep. Exactly. Rebaseable uh, persistent data, yeah. That's yeah. Important. Okay, well then maybe just take take a Rob already has and, uh, that. Uh, and I'd be curious what's what do you think the syntax could way hypothetically look like if you were to just say hey this data set or this clone has this property which I'm guessing is on, multiple uh, implementation participants. choices yeah um some of that could probably be abstracted array but I would so, assume it would be something in ZFS create uh, and then the origins would be one way. If so, if it contain if the data set just contains it, or it would I'm be a new command hybrid, and then uh, dash ZFS, o uh, origin. <laughs> it is, yeah, maybe it's ZFS a uh, new command. Maybe ZFS stack or something. Sta and okay, I like it. it. Yeah, uh, and it. Basically, it only allows you to stack uh, snapshots, and then uh, you would have to have a way to replace those. No, the sources wouldn't be clones, but uh, snapshots uh, in the design I discussed with Rob. But no, my mistake. And no. why you, dash o at that here. point? Are they well? Uh, you don't, also the pool create also doesn't require you to Comma. put an option before everyone. You would create a new name as first argument, and the remaining uh, argument vector would be the origins or whatever you would call that. And finally, the name of your actual hybrid you know that data the name uh, goes first, and then the sources follow. Ah. That would be the way the ZFS CLI for oh, okay. so create. 
for uh, Zpool ah. or yeah, for Z Zpool add, Zpool create. You put the pool name followed by. Cool. So feel free All to noodle written. on that document. Thank yeah. you for spelling that out more clearly because, hey, that's one that several people have had some notion of and we just want to bring and these people together. It could also be that Go you ahead. described another, there's the, I think one of the important design decisions is would you, we want this to be a, would we want the union to contain the persistent data or should it just be the aggregation of other data sets so that you can maybe uh, even put up paths and then you get an implied directory there so that you could say, really say this path, this uh, data set so that you could have multiple persistent data sets you can arrange at different paths. I don't know how hard that is to implement. Mm -hmm. It would definitely suit the container runtimes uh, but anything uh, along that direction should probably be analyzed by someone who is familiar with the code base and judge what is hard, how hard to implement correctly. That's that's the raison d'etre, but we do need the container expert to get to ask the right questions mm -hmm. to describe it accurately. So I don't know, for example, to what degree Doug Rabson is a ZFS user, but let's paint this picture. So thank you for that. Please noodle about that. And the document is wide open. You can add ideas as you've done in the past and flesh that out in syntax, crazy bunk hit ideas, whatever. So third one is I learned from Matt that uh, AVG at FreeBSD had a prototype of some form of continuous replication. I will reach out and find out where that went, what happened. I don't know, but uh, that's been the sort of Bigfoot in the woods that I've been hearing little rumors of. And so um, I will explore that. And just an underlying theme is in every discussion of high availability on ZFS, many of us trust ZFS more than any other part of the OS. So it's like, let's just as you've described with the OCI layers, let's get some core reliable functionality in the underlying file system and volume manager, and then access it through other means. Anyway, any thoughts on any of those two or three? So given that that had some sort of developer prep, I focused on organizing those, but I cleaned up this list a little. Uh, if anyone wants to associate their name with some topic, uh, Greg, we can have an offline discussion on just the whole compliance with various audits and such. Great. Um, Jan, you've touched on, I've already got you in there, channel programs and goodies. And I've reached out to AIC about a all flash JBOD, and I will, I suppose, do the same with uh, Supermicro. I don't have any amazing contacts with them, but if you do, please reach out. That's also That also goes for you listeners of this. And then uh, as we segue like mad... Uh, I'm, I've been discussing up to the minute with Patrick of BSD TV telepresence options. I confirmed that this nifty iPad next to me is ready for recycling, as Apple puts it, because it will not support Zoom, Meet, or Jitsi. So if anyone here has tablets that are compatible with modern streaming platforms, please step forward, because it's to a point that I, I'm thinking we almost want one to three tablets with connections to interested parties that we literally hand around and say, oh, can I can I ask a question to Matt or or Stu or whoever? And just have people as present as possible because that really didn't work out super well last year. So I'm open to ideas. If you have a tablet, great. Um, Andrew, as I recall, you might have a a bed to share in your room. And by that, I mean a second bed. <laughs> yes, there is a second uh, bed. It would be nice if someone other than me could track through either a Google Doc or a Collabora Office Doc or something about that coordinating because I don't want to get that fine grained on people's travel. I just don't have a mental bandwidth. Uh, if you'd like to help 
lead that, great. If not, I'll look for other people. Uh, who has a who who? Here's a who. Who has one or more tablets that support uh, Zoom, yeah, Jit dot, Jitsi, Meet? Meet uh, Apple. Yours. I type yours. Yours is that right? Is ready for recycling. It's like yeah, no, thank you, Apple. Great. They'll probably give me like a dollar. No, they wouldn't even trade in. So thanks, guys. Um, but it works just fine. Uh, looking for a foodie. I talked about that and. We will hopefully have a somewhat co-op model insofar as if there's surplus in the budget, it will go to things like the AV person who can fly out for, as it stands, about 150 bucks, which is pretty darn cheap from New, Jer New York area, New Jersey airport. Um, those are some comments from last time. And moving on to the actual call, I, and you need not care about this, I thought, oh, I'll just make the ZFS on Apple Silicon installation to my liking. So I set up a system with just 250 gigs of Mac OS and 750 gigs of, of FAT32 with the plan that I'd let it do its installation. I'd then get a working OS. I'd then install ZFS and then I'd replace the container. Um, and Jan, I can talk networking probably either later this week or after the event or talk to you in Dublin. Uh, but I made some progress last night with a fiber to uh, copper converter. But on this topic, I found that, ooh, without much trouble, I can delete that partition, like one would do in, say, GPART on FreeBSD in like two seconds. And then I thought, oh, I'll just add a type ZFS. And there are, you can, with the percentages, specify either a UUID type. By, def by default, if you don't specify, it'll give you FFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF
Uh, and but note could, the partitioning. I'm and, on yeah, this computer. They, yeah. Exactly. So, uh, but if you try to do any kind of block device level stuff on the volumes, you will find that it's impossible and it, I think they return a permission error. Okay. Even if it should be e operation not supported um, or IO error or something. Okay. Uh, at least for certain commands, even as we would. That, I don't remember the details. I just remember that it cost me a bunch of time. Okay. Well, my initial pull was on some kind of volume on a container on a thing like disk four. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I don't want that. So that's why I took this approach. At first, so it divvied up. It the looks heck out like of even you, the, they show up as disk something and then slice something. So it may actually be that they have a fake partition so that some other code just sees what it expects. I see. Okay. Um, and for completeness, I also tried the ability to like to reformat a partition, and it it seemed to always have like evidence of FAT32. The ghost in the machine just wouldn't quite leave. I forgot exactly how it appeared, but it was never quite what I was hoping for. Okay. And I suppose you, no, actually, I specified that correctly. And go ahead. Good. So now for the volumes, at least in Sonoma, it returns a resource busy. Okay. And you try a GPT show on an other hmm. uh, file system. But if you run mount, it claims that you have something mounted on, on this something sliced one. Uh, oh. Uh, okay. And finally, who I asked the organ, like, okay, who called it a ZFS data set? No, that's a partition for a pool, not a data set. Thank you very much. Andrew, you had something? Well, An idea? if you go back up yeah. for a second. Yeah. There. Oh, yep. The thing it looks like, I mean, it says Apple, it's creating Apple boot, boot OS X. Yes. Makes me wonder if they're trying to do this for a situation where you're actually putting your OS install within the ZFS and they've got some kind of, they're making a partition for some kind of bootloader. I think what they're doing is they're reserving mm -hmm. the space for EFI boot partition. Exactly. So that they can uh, all, uh, retroactively make that a uh, bootable disk. Yeah, that's what I'm that saying. They have to oh, interesting. Okay. That space. Uh, they may even put the UEFI partition on there and just assume that any uh, disk large as, over a certain size is big enough that you don't won't care, and they probably do it if it's big enough for a macOS installation. Uh, try again on a little one gigabyte USB stick. I yeah. hope they're not taking an eighth of it or a, or six or so for the potential boot <laughs> partition, but. Uh, well, that does sure sound like a code path from the like HFS X EFI days when it's like, oh, you're creating a partition. Obviously, you need an EFI partition, and it's treating it as if one, as if it's the entire disk; two, as if that was a requirement. And I wonder if there's a way to disable that ability. Which, for what it's worth, if it is a thing, it does. Uh, Q flag to not do that. Anyway. Thank you for listening to my tale of woe. Can you uh, um, give this util a list of partitions to create instead of uh, partitioning the disk and then creating partitions so that you give it an initial specification of what to put into the partition table? Yes, but I wanted to rely on the installer in recovery mode just doing its magic completely hands-off because there might be steps like blessing disks that take place somewhere and i yeah, i don't want to be a part of that <laughs> so anyway um and it creates a recovery disk and i wouldn't want to cr create a recovery partition but not populate it because who knows maybe those are separate steps i don't know i don't know and of course this is extremely poorly documented so here i am asking mostly probably non-mac users about 
Mac. Yeah, prediction. Apple's not always great about documenting things, and coming from me, that's a pretty big statement. Oh, and here's one more ridiculous one. I have this weird feeling that I had added the correct desired partition using G FreeBSD on an Intel machine, and I've been using ZFS. But our friends at in Apple Land have replaced target disk mode, which would let you, which would allow for many years a system to behave like an external drive plugged into FireWire and possibly USB and definitely Thunderbolt. They've replaced it with a new disk sharing for like migration. So you can put a machine into sharing mode and get this, you get an SMB par share as opposed to a hardware device. I'm like, really? No, that's not fair. Dude, no, it worked perfectly. Why did you remove that? Darn it. Anyway. So part rant, part who knows what, but I would love to be in control of this because I am terrified of not quite knowing what my underlying system is doing. And I, like I said, I initially had my ZFS partition in a container in a thing on a thing disk four. And I don't either want a snapshot of some kind to take up massive amounts of unforeseen space using Apple APFS technologies with a Z pool. And I don't, I don't even know what possible trouble there could be. So anyway, there I said it, there I said it. Um, I see a nifty link here. Thank you, Jan. And in the big picture, the... Uh... So this is a bit old, uh, okay. but the disk util partition disk command can take a disk with partitioning and then create an initial uh, partition on it. Okay. In one command, so that you start from a clean disk and end up with a initialized partition table with a single partition spanning almost everything on the disk. But at least back then, this was written, you got a EFI partition as well. Um, Hmm. But you don't okay. have to create the partition table as an empty partition table and then do never step to uh, create partitions. Cool. Um, I will take a look. I appreciate that. And yeah, it's like poorly documented then, then poorly documented after they changed everything. Like, okay, guys. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. One of the things is that they changed a lot, but they also did it mostly by adding stuff okay. instead of by invalidating old things, which is why you sometimes find strange uh, legacy emulation, uh, busy legacy behavior emulation. Uh. Hmm. Okay. Uh, did I successfully open a tab? Maybe. Ooh, with ads. Yeah, okay. And there this is, is for creating an EFI is called EFI. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I said it, it's not uh, the latest, but now you can look up the main page and mm -hmm. for the command and find out what the options are. At least you know which man yeah. page to go through with a fine comb. And our friends at Apple also have manual pages that are like not the, it's a, I don't know who came up with that style, but it's like uh, verb and verb. So you have to kind of mentally connect the two in your head rather than see it spelled out. I don't know what tech vendor came up with that idea long, long ago. But anyway. Anything else? Thank you for listening to my um, my outpour on that. Um, very much think about topics for the upcoming event. Um, I'm guessing at least the two of you can make it. I appreciate that. Um, and let's just uh, paint this picture. Greg, if you think your employer wants to be a uranium or bronze sponsor let me know that's a whole lot of muted participants 
So that said, I guess we've covered what we want to cover. Um, I thank you very much. And if anyone wants the honors, you're welcome to unmute and do that. Thank you, Greg. Like and subscribe. There you go. Thank you, everyone. Take care and have a great week. I'll be around in a few minutes.